Hi, folks. Thanks so much for joining us today. I'm so excited because our guest today is Brandi Gilmore. She is the author of a recent book called Master Your Mind and Energy to Heal Your Body. I just wanted to give you a quick summary of her background. And then, of course, we'll delve into her story. Brandi Gilmore is a world-renowned mind, body, and energy expert and speaker, best known for her discoveries in self-healing and personal transformation. Her work has been featured in media, in award-winning documentaries, and even documented under thermal medical equipment. Brandy Gilmore's goal is to empower people to heal themselves by providing information logically, straightforwardly, and practically to help them get tangible results. Furthermore, her mission is to bridge the gap between science and spirituality to help establish a new perspective on healthcare. The truth is that we all possess incredible potential when we learn to master our own minds. Brandy is also a sought after speaker who frequently addresses topics such as self-healing, resilience, overcoming adversity, peak performance, and more. So now I'd like to introduce you to Brandy. Hi everyone, thank you so much for joining us today. I did a quick intro uh, to our guest, Brandy Gilmore. And of course, that was just a quick rundown. So you know a little bit about her background, but I'm going to let Brandy give an explanation as to her life story, where she is today and why we're here. So Brandy, thank you so much for joining us. If you could tell everybody exactly why we're here today in your life story, that would be brilliant. Absolutely. You know, I, I have to say this is literally the last thing that I ever thought I would be doing. And and what I do today is show people how to get radical healing results using their mind under medical equipment. And long story short, I had an accident um, of over 20 years ago now. But if somebody had told me that I could heal using my mind, I would have thought that they were nuts or that they I probably even would have taken offense to it. Like, <laughs> I have a physical accident and a physical injury. How am I going to heal with my mind? And that's exactly what happened. I had a car accident and then I had a fall. And so, and at that time, I was just very, very analytical. And I worked in network engineering and operations. And at that point, when my doctor said that there was nothing they could do for me, it not it shocked me. Of course, number one, you never really expect to hear those words. But of course, it depressed me initially. And um, and I, I started really just looking outside of the box for answers. And I basically went through diet and supplements and all of the things. And what was profound and shocking was that I kept finding research. Like basically, a, a long story short, I got tired of all the marketing because every time there was some type of marketing and then I would take this supplement or this diet and I would try this thing and I would try it and try it and then I wouldn't get results. And I kept feeling like I got duped by all the marketing. And so I finally said, you know what, I'm going to start looking at the medical journals, like what's happening in medical research? What do I need to know? And I was searching everything from health and diet to metaphysics, to neuroscience, to psycho neuroimmunology, and everything in between. And I started finding just so many things that pointed to the mind. Like, for example, a person who has multiple personality disorder could have different illnesses and different personalities. And it just, it shocked me. <laughs> and it was pivotal. It was just like the, everything just kept pointing at the mind. And I, and I would say that I went on this journey to try to figure out how does it work? Um, and I did a lot of things that didn't work for many years to figure out what finally did work to heal my body. And I would say that's, that's why I'm here. Um, that's what I do today is I love to show results under medical equipment so people can see how it works. And I'll take somebody who's had chronic pain for years and show them how to use their mind and you can see it on the scan and, uh, and see them get radical results. And so, uh, that's my backstory basically and what, what I do and what I love and, um, what's, um, it, it's truly incredible what we're all capable of. It really is. Um, your story is, is quite riveting. I watched your Ted talk too. And I'll put the link, of course, all your links in the description of this video, as well as running across the screen. So you wrote a book called Master Your Mind and Energy to Heal Your Body. And very comprehensive, very comprehensive um, the kind of book you got to read twice, like to really dig into it and underline stuff and 
really make note because it's it's jam packed with so much useful information. So let let's talk about um, yeah, it's a great book. I loved it. Um, let's talk about your book, and of course. Um, I always like to share information that can help other people. And that was one of the things that really drew me into your story because I'm a firm believer in the mind being the center of it all as to our suffering, our happiness, the whole thing. And you read a lot and hear a lot about, you know, positive thinking and how the mind can, but a lot of people don't know how to get there. And I think your book is like a good roadmap for folks to do that. So that let's. That was exactly. Cool. Go ahead. Good, good. So let's talk about. And I might jump all over the place because, uh, as I was putting, <laughs> as I was putting questions together, um, it was kind of all over because I would read something and then I'd go back to it and say, "Oh, I have to ask her about that." So excuse me if it's a little all, all over the place, but um, I I wanted to ask you. First, you mentioned that it takes more than belief to heal. So you simply can't just believe it. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, basically, there was a few things that really kind of woke me up with that awareness. One of them was the awareness that I tried. I literally, I mean, I thought, okay, well, if I just meditate enough and I visualize myself healing and I picture it and I convince myself I'm already healed I'm already healed and and the affirmations and all these things I did it like literally with a hundred percent hundred two hundred percent commitment for well over a year and and on and it wasn't working and I even was telling people like I'm I'm healed I'm healing like it was just like okay well I just have to own it and believe it and be it and and it really wasn't working. And so as I was looking through the medical journals, I then came across something called the open label placebo. And this was mind blowing. And it's this, it's that, you know, I think most people believe that belief works because of the placebo. They they believe that, you know, the placebo works. And, and for anybody who doesn't know what the placebo is, uh, basically in any medical study, a portion of the participants get a real treatment and a proportion of the participants get a fake treatment. And research has shown time and time again that the, the participants that get the fake treatment can still have some type of results. They can still see a shift in their symptoms or whatnot. And so I thought, then a lot of people think, common thought is that it just has to do with belief. However, there's also something called the open label placebo, which is where both the doctor and the patient both know that it's fake and it still works. And some people call it the open label placebo. Some people call it the non-blind placebo. But that was shocking to me was the awareness that it's not just belief. And, and so that's what made me want to understand, well, how does the mind work? And it, it just made me continue my journey. And, and we can look at it also with somebody with multiple personality disorder that they can change between personalities and maybe have high blood pressure in one personality, but not in another and pain in another personality or, you know, uh, illness or blind. There was even a woman who was blind in some personalities and not others. And it wasn't because they believed. Yeah. It wasn't because they believed it. There was something deeper going on in the mind. And that's what I was trying to figure out is what was that? At so. what point did you, make that connection in your recovery like that it was something deeper going on with you something in your unconscious mind that needed healing like when did you make that connection i would say probably i was remain skeptical until i healed um because you really don't think especially because you know, i had an accident i had an injury and so um, so it was like, it was all over the place. It, I, I was willing to do anything to heal. And I would say that, you know, the, when I really started to get results and real results, that's when it became pivotal. Like, oh my gosh, this is going to happen. I think that part of the reason I became more and more skeptical as time went on is because I tried so many things and then they didn't work. And then I was, and then also because I was doing meditation and I thought, and with meditation, I could get my pain down at times. 
but it wasn't healing my body. It wasn't changing my life. And so after years and years and years and years of doing that, I started to lose belief that my body would actually heal. So I would say it, it was really about understanding there's, that there's a deeper level of it. And I would say it's kind of like one simple way to put it is like this, is that belief can be helpful. And, and an analogy to think about is like the four minute mile. And a, a kind of a simple awareness of the four minute mile is that it used to be thought it was impossible for people to run a mile in under four minutes. And then in the 1950s, Roger Bannister did it and he ran a mile in under four minutes. And then after he did, a bunch of other people did it as well. Now, when we stop and think about it, if you ask me, could I run a mile in four minutes right now? I would say, no, I'm physically capable like uh, of, of whatnot, but there's a skill to it. There's an understanding to it. And so I would have to know how to do it and, and understand it and train for it. And I would say the same is true with healing with the mind is that all the time I'll see people, even though if they believe it's possible, a lot of people that I work with have been on the healing journey for 10, 20, 30, 40 years. They believe it's possible, but they haven't got results and it's about understanding that there is a skill and there is an understanding so um so it, it would say until i started actually healing and getting real results i remember the moment when i said oh my gosh this is actually going to work i kissed the ground i was like crying i was like oh my gosh this is this is really going to work <laughs> so um it was when i started just yeah feeling better and, and my pain was going away and staying away and, and I was getting strength back in my body. And it was, it was, it was a pivotal moment. So prior to that, you had obviously um, a series of things that you would do or exercises that you would implement that made you have that epiphany that this is going to work. So you set up this routine for yourself and then like, I guess you would practice it over time and then you s gradually started to see results. Is that how it kind of went down? Yeah. You know, once I started to get clarity, it happens pretty, it, it actually happens a lot faster than I, than I would have realized. So, but I had been doing like meditation and affirmation and theta state and all of these things for a long period of time. I actually had this moment where uh, a friend of mine who uh, during that time, uh, she called me up because her aunt was passing away and she asked me if I wanted to say goodbye. She was passing away from lung cancer and she asked me if I wanted to say goodbye and I said yes. And so she picked me up and she took me over to her aunt's house. And when I was there, I of course said goodbye, but I also had this awareness that, I mean, she had been in hospice for a while and in and out of the state of consciousness. And she had been somebody who was thinking positive and the affirmations and all these things. And, and when I saw her there, I thought, gosh, this is what I look like. Like, I, cause I was spending so much time every day in meditation and theta state and, and all of these things. And so after that, it was kind of like, I, I, that's when I was like, I have to do something more. Like I saw, it was just, it was one of those moments where you think I, I just have to do something more. And basically what it, what I started doing is because I had already been doing the visualization and, and at that point is I started realizing that I needed to be more specific with my mindset. And what I did is after that moment, I thought, okay, I, I said, I have to simplify everything. It has to make sense. Like I'm trying to just get this woo woo thing to work that I don't really understand, but I'm just doing all of the things to make it work. And I need to understand it more. And don't get me wrong. I like the woo woo. Uh, but I just needed, I feel like if we understand, it's like, if you don't know how to fly a plane, but you're in hitting all the buttons, I don't know how successful that's going to be. And so, uh, so I thought, okay, I'm hitting all the buttons and I'm trying everything, but how do I make this successful? And what I did is a few things, two things were really pivotal. One, I would say that I said, okay, well, if I simplify everything, how can I see that the mind affects the physical body. And I said, okay, emotions. We all know that if somebody's embarrassed, their face turns red. Uh, even emojis know that on our cell phone, the face turns red. We all, we all got that. Um, or panic attack, racing heart, shortness of breath, or sexual thought, sexual physical response, different for men or women. Um, and so I could see different emotions affect the body or even somebody who's scared to death, who's so scared their heart just stops or, um, broken heart syndrome where somebody dies from a broken heart 
And so I could see that emotions could, different emotions affected us in different way. And that was really pivotal. I could also see that even though I had been overlooking emotions and thinking they're not that important, that they could affect us to the point of death. And even there's, I mean, there's even studies from Harvard that suggest that autoimmune conditions can be caused by stress. And I mean, on and on and on about all of the studies about how much stress can impact the body. And even, I mean, last year, a surgeon general put out a warning about loneliness and how it can increase type two diabetes and stroke and all of these things. And, and so I was like, okay, well, I was opening my mind to stress and emotion, but still, you know, looking at all of that. But I would say that another key piece was this, is that I looked at it objectively and I said, but wait a second, not everybody who's stressed has illness. There are people even with PTSD, with severe trauma, who aren't sick. How does that work? And there are people who even retired who have illness. How does that work? And what I began to realize and put together was that it took a combination of emotions was the key. And so a simple way to think about it is if somebody wants to make cake and they have flour, well, they can't make cake. But if they have flour and they mix it with eggs and butter or vegan eggs and butter or whatnot, then they can make cake. And if they change the recipe, then they make a completely different meal. And similarly, that's how I saw it was possible for somebody with multiple personality disorder to have some personalities that had no health issues, no documented health issues at all. And other personalities might have back pain or high blood pressure and other others might have asthma or allergies. I mean, it just, and so that's what I started to put together was it was specific emotions and also the combination. And, and so that was, that was pivotal. And, and so from that point, I went instead from meditating and visualizing and thinking positive and, you know, I'd been in the theta state and all of those things. I said, okay, well, I'll keep the visualization. So there were certain things that I kept and then certain things that I said, okay, well, instead of ignoring what's in my subconscious mind, let me identify what's going on in my subconscious mind and identify the specific emotions that could be affecting me. And let me start transforming those. And so uh, that's when it started becoming pivotal in conjunction with the uplifting and the positive neural pathways and, um, and all of that. that and I sense. think that's key. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> I, I think that's key uh, for me to hear because um, how did you go about identifying these issues that were in your subconscious mind? Did you go to therapy? Did you journal? Like, how did you reach into the depths of your subconscious to discover what was preventing you or keeping you in illness and preventing your healing? There were multiple things that I did. One, I had to first admit that I even had emotions. I think I, I, I grew up in a in a household that, you know, and even in, in corporate world, it was like, leave your emotions at the door. And I thought that I was like, I thought, I really thought I didn't have negative emotions just because what would happen is if something came up, I would just be like, whatever. And I would bury it. And I was so good at burying it that I thought I didn't have any negative emotions. And so I would say one was becoming aware that I even had subconscious emotions because you're not because I mean, well, I, I wasn't because if you think about it, subconscious emotions are exactly that they are below consciousness. So they were below my consciousness. And I didn't even realize I had. Them. And so uh, that was key. And then understanding that subtle emotions, that uh, that subtle emotions matter, that it, kind of like a, a way to think about it is like this, is that I started realizing, well, if, if I had the same emotion last week and the same thought or emotion the week before or a couple of days before or a couple of days before, it could only mean one thing, that it was a patterned way of thinking and feeling in my subconscious mind. And so the more I started to understand that there were patterns, then that was also key because repatterning the way that the mind thinks um, is key. And, and so um, that's a key part to think about because a, a simple way to, to, to really illustrate this is 
you know, some people might have patterns of guilt or patterns of frustration or anger or hurt or rejection or whatever it is. And we think these are just patterns, but these patterns can affect our health and they affect people's health all the time. They just don't realize it. And so that's the awareness that I started to look at was the repatterning and um, kind of a simple way to think about these patterns and then and us not realizing that they're affecting us would be to think about somebody let's say somebody's having a panic attack and they don't realize that emotions are causing it and then they might go oh my gosh what's happening to my heart what's happening to my lungs now this may sound silly except for the fact that people go to the emergency room all the time thinking they're having a heart attack and the doctor says oh it's anxiety and a person doesn't even know they're necessarily feeling a bunch of anxiety. They think it's a heart attack. And so if we look at and we really expound upon that awareness that somebody can have emotions that are affecting them, anxiety, and it's affecting them and they think it's a heart attack and they're having an anxiety attack, I would say similarly, these emotional patterns in our, our subconscious mind are affecting the back pain, the knee pain, the uh, health issue, the autoimmune condition, whatever it is. And we just don't realize that it's happening. And so that's the way I've been able to help people get radical results is by under, is by understanding and identifying those specific emotions. And so, uh, sorry, you had asked me how I did it. And that's what I started becoming aware of patterns, subtle emotions, and then asking, um, asking my body and, and, um, and getting more awareness around emotions. So, and if, if this delves too much into your personal life, of course, let me know. But did you experience a did you experience like growing up a specific trauma or was your childhood not all that that you had hoped for? Like, or was it just like a compilation of things that you said you buried or just didn't acknowledge and pushed away? Well, it depends on what we identify as trauma, um, and I would say. Overall, I had a pretty great family. And also there was a lot of stuff. We we would joke around and say, we put the fun in dysfunctional. That was kind of the family saying. <laughs> it, <laughs> it was beautiful and wonderful. And, you know, it had its things like anybody's childhood. Sure. There were, there were things in my parents split up and all these things. But I, I would say that what ultimately affected me was this, is I had been, you know, Florence Scovel Shin was I mentioned I've been studying everything from metaphysics to neuroscience and psychoneuroimmunology and everything in between. And Florence Scovel Shin is uh, was a metaphysics teacher from the early 1900s. And there was something that I had read by her, which was something to the effect of, you know, if you're not, if you're blind, you're not wanting to see, or if you're hearing, if you have a hearing problem, you're not wanting to hear. And so I started really kind of, uh, it was just a, a couple sentences of what she had wrote, but I kind of started with that basic concept and really expanded on it a lot and, and started thinking about my nervous system. And so what I had is I had a neurological disorder, CRPS, complex regional pain syndrome and spinal and plate fractures and, and different things like that. But I started asking myself, um, uh, why is my nervous system, wh why is my nervous system responding abnormally? Like, wh which is basically, you know, it's an abnormal response from your ner nervous system. And so I started asking, what, it, what is my abnormal response? What is, what is happening? And if we think about it for a moment, what is the nervous system? When you think about the nervous system, what do you think? You think fight, flight, freeze, right? And I thought, well, why is my nervous system in an abnormal response of fight, flight, freeze? What's going on? And so what I started to look at was that I, uh, during the events of 9-11, I had been in the office on the West Coast. So I worked in California and I did network engineering and operations at that time, but I worked 5 a.m. to 2 p.m. So I, I was in the office in Pacific time on the phone with people in the trade center when the, when the towers got hit. And then my coworker was yelling, basically, help me, help me, help me. And then the phone went dead. Now, at that point, all I wanted to do was help my coworker, you know, and, but what happened after that 
was, you know, our networks were going, were down because everything went down um, in that area. Mm -hmm. And so I was working now in telecommunications, you have to have televisions on every pillar, like our television, you have to know current events, basically. So there were televisions all around me. And so for months and months and months after that, I watched the footage over and over in my peripheral vision of the events of 9-11. And not only that, but if you remember, there was like the terrorist, are we in red zone or orange or whatnot? And so what was basically happening is it was ingraining in my nervous system. It like, there was a feeling of wanting to die for others. And then also a feeling of feeling afraid that we're going to die at any moment, we're going to die. And I'm sitting here working and we're going to die. And then also wanting to die for others. And, and then, you know, I see fallen heroes being honored for then dying for others and whatnot. And so that was going in my mind. And, and so, so basically my nervous system was like, I'm going to die, but I also want to die. And so that's what was programmed in my subconscious mind. Now, building on that, that had been a pattern for me that was back to a young age. So at a very young age, let's say, and I don't know, I, I deleted the information now, but let's say I was somewhere around six or seven years old that somebody had asked me, would you die for your younger siblings? And, and at that age, I was like, well, no. And then somebody else said yes. And then suddenly I felt immediately like, oh, well, maybe I should have said yes, like embarrassed that I wouldn't. Like, I was like, why well, I just would save them and I would just want them to live. And what do you mean? Like, why would I have to die for them? <laughs> that was not my rational thought at that age. And so anyway, so, but what happened was there was an embarrassment if I didn't die for others. So then when that was happened, it was like, how could I be just sitting here at my desk when other people are dying to save others? And here's these firefighters and I'm doing nothing. And what, so it was like this whole, so, so yeah, so I, I did have that going back to the awareness that it was a patterned way of thinking and feeling. There was always this pattern that if you saw, like, if I saw something, it was like, oh, I should die to save that person or this, like, it was a, it was a normal way of thinking. And yet the events of 9-11 also then exponentially triggered that pattern um, to a huge level. And then in addition to that, I also had survivor's guilt. I felt you know, guilty for surviving at that time while well, I felt like we should all be in mourning because there was a there was a mourning energy for like you know watching that over and over for eight ten hours a day you know there's a mourning feeling of the events of 9-11 when it's the TV are all sitting around your desk and so that so basically it not it, it triggered a pattern that I already had and then uh increased it exponentially <laughs> wow and so uh yeah so is it the identifying these emotions, talking about it so you can process them, like the healing that begins for you? Like what, what was that connection that you made where you, you, you kissed the ground and said, this is going to work? Is it the identifying of these negative emotions or repressed emotions just identifying um, them. Yeah. So we've well, asked two different questions, but the, when I, when I kissed the ground crying, it was because I forgot as human beings, we could even get down on our knees. And I was like, I, which sounds odd, but I had seen, and I was like, oh my gosh. And I got down on my knee. It was like, and I, I think I used my cane at that time to do that. But the fact that I could, it was like, it was a progress. So that was, that was one thing, but as far as identifying the emotions, um, uh, it, it's not just talking about them or journaling about them. It's really rewiring them. Mm. And what we have to remember is everything that happens in the mind, it, everything the mind does, it does for a reason. And the way to put it is kind of like this, is that a simple analogy, a simple but unfortunate analogy is that let's say that um, a cutter cuts themselves. They might get linked up to that, right. a feeling of relief or euphoria or control from cutting themselves. You've heard that before, right? Yeah. And it's unfortunate and it makes no logical sense, but that's what gets linked up. And so what happened is I had a pride in wanting to die for others and also an embarrassment, like a shame. Like if I didn't, it was bad. 
And that was wired in my subconscious mind from a very young age. So I had to actually rewire my mind and change that, which may sound odd, but it kind of all of the time. One example is this, is that people can get love linked up to sympathy. And if they get that linked up, then they'll want sympathy at a subconscious level. Or even another way to put it is like this, is that um, we've all heard before, if a child doesn't get positive attention, they'll get negative attention. So then a child could get linked up at a very young age. I need to get attention in negative ways because if not, I will be ignored. If everything is fine with me, if I'm happy and healthy, I'll be ignored. And so, or somebody might have a feeling of pride and hardship. Like the more hardship they go through in life, the more deserving they are. And so they can get that linked up. Or another thing is like this, we need love. We, as human beings, we need love. And so have you ever seen this before in our culture where maybe a child falls down or gets an owie and somebody says, let me kiss your owie and make it better. Yeah. So then they get love linked up to owie, mm -hmm. to illness. So then what happens is in our culture, loneliness is this huge epidemic. Right. So then the subconscious mind says, I'm lonely, I'm lonely, I'm lonely. How do I get love? Oh, I remember if I was a kid and I had an owie, I could go get love. And so that can be linked up. So my point is, is it's more than positive thinking. It's more than meditation. It's about understanding at a subconscious level where something got miswired and about correcting that wiring. And that's when I see, again, you know, people get incredible results. And even the studies that I had published in a medical journal last year, that was exactly what I did is I just identified what the pattern was and help people to start shifting that exact pattern. Ah, oh, that makes a lot of sense. Are these neural pathways something that you can instantly change or does science tell us that they take time? Like, like when you want to break a bad habit, you have to do it like eight times or something so what's that like? Um, well, I would say the truth is this, is that let's be honest, somebody can experience a trauma and there are ne strong neural pathways around that. It is something that is very memorable or even somebody can get married only once and it becomes memorable. They don't have to get married 30 days in a row for that to sink in. So is it possible to create new neural pathways uh, with just one um, event? Yes, but it would have to be very, very, very strong emotions. Typically speaking, when we're repatterning something, it is going to take repetition. It is because creating that strong of emotion and not only that, but a lot of times when we go to rewire the mind, it may feel completely foreign to us. Like some people, for example, may have never really felt the feeling of love. And I'll see that with people or for some people, the idea of feeling deserving or some people have guilt so strong they almost feel guilty for wanting to get rid of guilt and so it just it really depends on what's wired in the mind and and but yeah so typically speaking the the best way to think about it is like the alphabet is just like to mem to memorize the alphabet and get it stored up we have to do it over and over and over and over and over repeatedly and that's exactly what i did for my own mind to change it and reprogram it is instead of of course the alphabet I got my mind and nervous system used to reprogramming it by wiring it and wiring it over and over and over again to feel in a different way and programming it in. And it's like a, you know, so your emotions and your nervous system, your body feels differently. And that's, that's what's key to make the shift is it, it does typically take strong follow through and, in, and making strong new positive emotions and, and then also being clear on rewiring. So your injury, injuries were very real. You know, you got in a car accident, you were injured, right? And then you fell, which was tragic, and you were injured there. So your body experienced these injuries for real. So the pain associated with the fractures you had and other injuries was very much real. But your pain, as your body healed, like the fractures, I guess, would heal, you're saying that your pain didn't heal because of your emotional problems or your subconscious burying all this pain. And that's what prevented you from healing. Am I, am I right? 
CRPS, so complex regional pain syndrome, is a lot. So like like the nickname for it is also like the suicide disease. Like it's it's extreme amount of pain. So I was on morphine for about six and a half years, somewhere in there. Not only did morphine, but in various forms of morphine, but I mean, a lot of other medications also. I was having nerve ablations, infusions, injections. Um, I would go in for like a push like and, and whatnot. But um, so, I mean, so yes, but the body doesn't just, he, like the, the problem was, even with CRPS, part of what it is, is that the body does overreact to something. So the fall was one thing and then the body does overreact. But I say that, and also I've seen people heal from all kinds of things. I've seen people with low blood volume then have regular blood volume. I've seen people um, heal from, I mean, uh, I've, I've seen people with uh, cysts, huge physical cysts where you can see it and they start working with their mind and the cyst literally goes away. Wow. So it's it's very, uh, yeah, it's, it's incredible where you, you can see physical results. I've seen people before have tumors uh, that then they're working with their mind. And, and if you think about it for a moment, it's kind of like the opposite of stress, if you will. You know, we've heard before that stress can actually influence tumors and make somebody's tumor or whatnot come back. And that's the thing. We've heard stress can affect the physical body in all kinds of ways. And, and one way that I started to think about it in my own life, because I was very much in that in that way, I thought, well, how is it possible that my, my mind is going to affect my physical body. And there were a couple of things that were really profound to me. Uh, one was this, was that we know that if somebody has a brain injury, it can paralyze their body. So if they have it on the right side, it can paralyze the left side of the body. The left side can paralyze the right side of the body. And I thought, well, wait a second. If the brain can control every part of the body, doesn't it also have the ability to heal every part of the body as well? So that was one piece. But Another piece, and there were multiple pieces, but another piece was this, is I started to look at it as like an emotional stroke, if you will, just like if emotions are triggering in the brain, then how are they affecting that corresponding part of the body? And and so that was another uh, piece. And what was kind of fascinating about that is there was actually research from neuroscientists, neurosurgeons, uh, Penfield and Boldry, who did this um, research where basically what they had done is they stimulated different parts of the brain to see where it showed up in different parts mm -hmm. of the body. And it's mm -hmm. fascinating that, you know, one part of the body they could, or brain, they could stimulate one part of it, the insular cortex, and they could see that somebody would want to vomit. And so, there, so there's different areas of the brain that we can stimulate it. And what's also fascinating is that emotions show up in different areas of the brain. And so, so there's so many ways that we can look at the brain body connection. Yeah, but, I mean, uh, and now with uh, fRMI, you know, technology, I'm sure they could really delve into that and pinpoint a lot of a lot of that. That's exactly so. fMRI scans. Um, that's so part of what when I when I healed myself, that was exactly what I said. I said, well, because people used to think that emotions were stored in the amygdala, and that was primarily where they where all the activity occurred. But then in 2013, Carnegie Mellon did, uh, researchers from Carnegie Mellon did this study that did show that different emotions generate activity in different regions of the brain. And, you know, if somebody's sad, it shows up different than if somebody's happy, or if somebody's feeling disgust, it shows up different than fear. And, and so uh, exactly that, which is how I started looking at, okay, well, different emotions must affect the body Absolutely. in different ways. So yeah. what are biophotons and light energy? Where does that come in, in the healing process? Absolutely. So one of the things that was very fascinating to me was this, is that as, as I was researching the placebo, I started thinking about how is it possible for a fake pill to act different depending upon what a person's told? So if one person's told it could affect their blood pressure, it can. If another person's told that it can affect their Parkinson's, it can. Now, typically it doesn't heal the body, but it can create a biochemical response and and, uh, and usually the effects wear off after a while and whatnot. But either way, it can help with the symptoms. 
and whatnot. So, uh, so point being is that what I started doing is I thought, well, how is this information being communicated through the body? And I also, it, there were, there was just so many things, but I started looking at biophotons, the energy of the body. And a lot of times people think that energy of the body is just woo woo. Like, you know, oh, well, you know, and don't get me wrong again. I like the woo, but I also like the science to meet the woo because they actually explain each other. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and so there's a direct bridge between the two. But so as I was looking at the energy of the body, which most people think is just a woo woo thing, the man who medically discovered it is Alexander Gershwich back in the 1920s. So a hundred years ago. And when he did, he was nominated for the Nobel prize 11 times in the U S and one in Russia. And it's profound because here we are a hundred years later and we don't really hear about bio photons or energy of the body. And most people think it's, it's fake, but there's also a database that's under the NASA agreement that is maintained by the Smithsonian and Harvard that has current day studies of bio photons of energy of the body in it from like, I mean, there's current research being added to it all of the time and, and kind of to unpack this for anybody that might sound um, odd about bio photons, a simple way to think about it is like this, is that if we think about a light bulb, a light bulb emits particles of light and which are photons or uh, the sun emits particles of light, which are mm -hmm. photons. Mm -hmm. Our bodies emit particles of light, which we call bio photons. Mm -hmm. And so, oh. and, and so, uh, and so basically the energy of the body and what's fun is, I mean, when we start to look at the energy of the body, uh, a few things, um, different illnesses have different energy, different bio photon emissions. What's also incredible is that our own minds have the ability to direct this energy throughout the body. So there's even studies where researchers had uh, participants visualize white light and they had increased bio photon emissions out of the right side of their head, but not the left. And so, or anger, anger increases bio photon emissions. Now, something that's kind of important about this when it comes to energy is that all of the time you'll hear people say, well, just increase your energy if you want to heal, just increase your energy. You just have to send more energy and just increase your energy. But anger can actually increase. So when like participants are feeling more and more anger, it actually increases bio photon emissions. So it's, it's more than just increasing your energy. It's understanding that our minds have the ability to direct, uh, gotcha. to direct it. And I, I have to ask this, did you, um, prior to your injury or during or after, were you, um, into any specific religion? Were you a spiritual person? And if so, how did that impact the rest of it. You know, um, so I was raised Lutheran and then I got away from that in my teenage years. And so I, I kind of just became more agnostic and was not really connected to any, you know, just very, very much, very agnostic, very much into science. And so I would say the way it helped me was this is as I started really researching, um, I, I actually became very, so I, I'm very spiritual. And whatever you want to call it. So I always tell people, whatever you want to call it, universe, God, divine energy, mother nature, there is a life force energy that, you know, we emit bio photons, but, and, and energy, but there is a life force energy kind of like this is that when we like part of the reason I feel like medical science has really overlooked bio photons or two reasons is one, because they're hard to measure. And two, because a lot of foundational research and the medical system was done on cadavers, dead bodies that don't have any light energy, but the awareness that the light energy. So whether you could want to call it life force energy, God, universe, divine, mother nature, we are all, it's a spiritual awareness. And, and, and another way we could really link it up is also, if we look in the Bible, 3000 years ago, it says, um, in the Bible, it says a merry heart is a medicine to the body. Ill thoughts will dry the bones. So it's basically saying happy thoughts will help your body heal and stress will help your body go dry the bones. You know, it, it uh, uh, and, and so it's even written there, which I, I hadn't known previously, but I would say that I'm, I'm very, very spiritual. 
That's good. Because I, I believe there's a definite connection there as well. Um, so when folks buy your book and read it, what can they expect? So let's use um, just an example. Somebody suffering from some debilitating disease. They want to discover wellness the way that you did. Um, what can they expect when they read your book? Can they expect hope? Uh yeah, I mean, um, even I've had people emailing in and saying, oh, my gosh, I was able to release my pain or I, yeah, I, all kinds of things. And so um, and of course, it does take follow through. That's what I always tell people is, is, you know, when I demonstrate results, I make it look really, really, really easy. It does take real change. And so I would say part one is getting a lot logical understanding. It just puts all of the research, including the energy of it. So you see it. And it just makes sense, which is really helpful. Even people who have been on the spiritual or self-help journey for 10, 20, 30, 40 years have read it and said, oh my gosh, this actually really helped me to understand it. Or people I see all the time where, um, you know, women or people in general will say, my spouse hasn't been very spiritual and hasn't been into all this mind, body healing stuff. And their spouse reads it and goes, oh my gosh, this makes so much sense. So that's what I'd say is part one is making sense. And then you also start to see that the combination of emotions. And so I would say that is another key is that the, the combinations, like we talked about different recipes or different illnesses. And so you start to really see that. And then, um, and, I, and then I would say, and then part two is all about understanding emotions in a whole new way. You know, our culture does not understand unfortunately, how to work with emotions, which we have so much depression and, and anxiety and, and trauma and, and all of these things that we really need to, uh, to transform. And so it's a step two is a step-by-step -step process on understanding emotions in a completely different way. And even understanding that they, tr they shift our consciousness. And so there's, there's key pieces to, to understand that can empower, um, empower us to understand our own minds. Cause I, that's what I feel like is that at the end of the day, Everybody needs to understand their own mind, how it works, how it heals the body, how it can create our lives. Um, and that's the the uh, the the step by step process is actually called the gift method. And that's because when I see people really heal themselves, mm -hmm. it becomes a life changing gift. It's like you it, it changes you in, in a beautiful, beautiful way. I am not the same person that I used to be in a beautiful way. And, and so. Um, and so I would say that that's what they can expect. That's amazing. Now I've been on your website, which is brandygilmore.com. And of course I'll have that running across the screen. You've got courses on here, right? Brandy that folks can take. So in addition to your book, there are these, uh, you have other supplemental ways for folks to continue their journey of healing. Absolutely. Absolutely. For some people, they feel like they'd prefer to watch a videos uh, to really get the information in. And then also not only that, but then in the courses, there's it's like uplift and transformational calls to help you to radically feel different. So it's it helps to access emotions even easier. And so that's what that's there for. So you don't do any do you do private consultations as well, like one on one kind of thing? Or is this mostly just done through? the internet it's mostly done through i do some classes i do uh, I, I i i at my heart that's what i love people i love working with people so sometimes i do some here and there but my biggest thing is also classes and making a bigger difference and helping more and more people and also empowering everybody i think that yeah the biggest thing is the more everybody understands how to use their mind is uh, is incredible now so at what company. point did you i know we're getting close to closing here and and Again, I'm so fascinated. Your journey is truly a miracle. Um, at what point did you start implementing uh, working out? You know, uh, you were you were in really bad shape, and then you started healing. I guess mentally or emotionally, right? And then when when did you go to the gym? Like when? Because I saw some video on that. Yeah, I, I laughed because after I kissed the ground. So I started having these moments where I felt like, like literally, okay, so this is what happened. So, so I literally, I saw somebody who got down on their knees. I think it was to like to fix a, I don't know, like a, a DVD player or something like that, which tells you how long ago this was. But, uh, but 
Uh, but I was like, oh my gosh. And then, so I used my cane to, to see if I could do that in the bed. And basically I was able to, and I was like, and I, so I knocked on my neighbor's door and I was like, and I was crying and she's like, is everything okay? And I'm like, yes, I've got this. And she's like, what? And it was, it was really sweet. So I was like, can you take a picture? Which I don't know where that picture is to this day, but I was like, I kissed the ground and she took the picture and I was like, I feel like I can do anything. I want to ride a bike, and so, which was a terrible idea. Uh, but then basically a long story short, I decided to start going to the gym instead. So it was just these moments of, um, of, of like when you just, uh, you just feel like you're coming back alive and it was so that's what it was so uh the honestly the timeline for me is very uh challenging but i would say there was like this um put it this way there was like this four or about a four month period of time where i started going to the gym as i was getting better and then i kissed the ground like i was like oh my gosh i can do this and i, I would say it was about this four month period of time ish and that when you don't care what day it is for a lot of years, uh, time is a funny thing. And when you're meditating and checked out a lot and all like, it just, time is a funny thing. Um, especially when you just don't want to know what day it is or what year it is. So, um, that's how I felt. I felt like my life was passing me by and it's like, I don't know. I don't want to know what day it is. I don't want to know what year. Um, and so, uh, but, um, but that's what I, I started feeling this, like I just wanted to, and so do more. And, and I was like, okay, well, I'm going to get into yoga because that looks really easy, which yoga is actually harder than it looks is what I, <laughs> um, initially. So, um, but that's what I started. That's what I started doing is I, I started putting myself into these classes on, uh, and then I did that a little bit. And then uh, like one or two, I mean, not a lot, maybe three or four times, but what I ultimately started doing was I started just going to the gym and I would just hold weight and then I would leave and then I would hold weight and then I would leave. And so it became this thing where I would just started building muscle. Cause I was afraid to move too much at that point. I was afraid, Oh my gosh, if I hurt something, if I, mm -hmm. so, and I was still very, very weak and still so I was, I mean, my, my legs at the time were like the same size as my arms. And so there was a lot of, um, a lot of, I, there was a lot of different things that I did. Um, even to the point where to kind of, to get my balance back, I would, uh, I would sit like on this yoga ball and because I, I had this thing where I had lost my balance and I, and I was used to using a walker or a cane for so long that, um, that I like if I went to go lose my balance when I was, I was as I was trying to work on walking, I would flap my wings like I was gonna catch on this. Like I it was my it was my response. And so um so what I had started doing was I just sat on a ball and I would tip it over a little bit to the side and then I would step out with my foot and then I would tip it to the other side and then step out with the other foot. So then I got my body used to doing so reflexes. So it was it was a process of getting the reflexes and then, yep. Yeah, and then going to the gym and, and what happened at the gym is that these bodybuilders, they said, they were watching me and they said, we've never seen anybody do what you've done in the amount of time that you have done it. If you ever want to work out with us, you can. And I was like, yes. And so then I started with, so it's just this whole thing that just gained so much momentum and um, just a beautiful, um, it's just coming back to life. Yeah. So, so how, how many years ago was your initial um, injury? What year was that? I was in 03. Oh, okay. So 21 years ago. And then so. from then to, to when you kissed the ground, how, how many years was that roughly? I know you said it was kind of difficult. I, yeah, I would say basically I would say 2009, I was really, 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 really getting better. And I would say that the, basically kind of the, the, the memory of the last moment for me uh, is as I was getting better, um, the end of 2009, and then I sold my house and I was like, okay, um, I, yeah. So I would say the end of 2009 uh, into 2000, the beginning of 2010, that's when I was like, okay, like I feel healthy. <laughs> Amazing. Um, just to give folks a, a time frame so they can kind of see, you know, and understand your journey. Well, Randy, in closing, what words of hope 
can you give to folks that are either were in a similar position or suffering from whatever? Um, what kind of hope and, and what could you say to them to not give up? I would say this. I would say a few things. I would say, first, I have seen people uh, heal from all kinds of things, from being bedridden to running and flying, not not personally flying, but flying in a plane again. <laughs> uh, so I'm not going to say this is going to give you the ability to fly. But uh, but I have seen people heal from all kinds of things. Now, the tricky part is, is this. We've literally heard that stress can affect the physical body. Even if somebody has rheumatoid arthritis, they can have stress and it causes a flare up or stress and cancer or stress and autoimmune or stress and heart disease or stress and blood pressure, or stress and diabetes. We know this stuff that stress affects the physical body and we have to go beyond the top layer to understand emotions and patterning and the subconscious mind. So the answer is literally sitting all around us and we're all ignoring it and overlooking it. And when we start to actually realize that the subconscious mind can, the, the, is, is that incredible. The other thing that really woke me up is the awareness that the body is continuing to repair and replace cells. Science even estimates that we have a whole new skeleton every 10 years. And so I thought about that and I thought, well, wait a second, how is it possible then for somebody to have the whole football injury from high school, if the body's constantly repairing and replacing cells and all of that. So what I would say is just, we're more amazing than we realize. And this is just, um, yeah, the more we understand the mind, the more we empower ourselves to have a happy, healthy, incredible life. Beautiful. Well, thank you so much for sharing that today. And I, I, I truly believe your story is a miracle. Thank you so much. And I have to say thank you for your heart. And you, I, you're just, you're beautiful. Thank you for what you do. Thank you so much. And of course, I'm going to put your website, all the good information running across the screen as well as in the description. I really want folks who are suffering to read this book because I found it fascinating and, and I have to reread it because a lot of what I was doing was prepping to talk to you. So Next time I read it, I want to read it with myself in mind. Um, and I really want folks to to be able to heal and find that same miracle that, that you found. I mean, I call it a miracle because you made the miracle happen. You, you and you're connected to the universe and your spirituality and your unconscious mind. So, Brandy, thank you so much. God bless you. And I would love to speak with you again someday. Um I think this topic has a lot to talk about. Thank you so much. And I would love the same. You're just, you're beautiful. You have a beautiful heart. And, and so thank you. And thank uh, you. Definitely. God bless. We'll be in touch. Sounds good. Thank you.